Um, so moving on, let's kind of look at some of the other stuff that we talked about this past week. Um, Gabe, you wrote about OnLive, uh, and you wrote this article called, like, the OnLive Loose Ends, where um, – remind us of OnLive and then what, what are these loose ends? Yeah, I mean, it was a follow-up, and I don't think that we talked last week about the first OnLive article that I wrote – uh, that kind of breaks down on live desktop um, on live desktop. If you haven't heard about it yet, it was kind of all the rage at CES, except they didn't even have a booth there. They just announced it during CES and had some people at the, at the show. Right, Jack. Yeah, no booth. Right. So, um, so still though, it got a lot of press during and around CES and they released it during then it's actually, it's a, it's a desktop as a service solution, but it's aimed at uh, the, the same, it, it's aimed at consumers right now and not at businesses. OnLive is known for their gaming, uh, their cloud-based gaming solution where they send you basically a thin client um, that, a, a, and a controller, and you can use that to stream games down to you from the cloud. It's, um, and, and it actually works really well if you have a wicked connection. But when you say um, stream, it's like, it's like, from, it's like server-based computing games. It's not actually putting the game onto your device and running locally. Uh, yeah, you're, yeah, you're right. I, I mean stream more like you're watching a movie streaming a video uh, across, except they've 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 enhanced that even more because they not not only do you have to watch this but you also have to be able to interact with it in real time so you're right it is more like a remoting protocol that we that we talk about you know every day in our normal lives uh but that's not how they refer to it or pitch it to you know the consumers that they're talking to right because um, consumers don't know what the hell a thin client because we're yeah. like oh it's just a remote desktop but for games but yeah, it's right. Their world streaming. All right, anyway. and it does go beyond that. I mean, the, the challenges that they have. You know, we, we have enough issues alone remoting a YouTube video to people. So, um, you know, so so if they're talking about 720p video and and things like that, I mean, they do a pretty good job, especially with the real time back and forth data, or um, you know, the data that they have to send. Now, it requires a lot of bandwidth. So, and and, and so you know, we're we're both quick to jump on it and say, well, Citrix and VMware would do just fine too if you gave them seven megs of bandwidth. <laughs> yeah, because they're the ones that said that this is the th- the thing where where the OnLive guy is saying like, look how much better we are than Citrix. And then you read the requirements, and for 720p video, they require five megabits. And I'm like, wait a minute, so 720p? That's not even like desktops are higher than that. <laughs> desktops are like higher than 1080p even. They're like 1900 by 1200 and we care about every pixel. None of this like JPEG. Oh, just like guess what those letters are over there and mash them together. So, yeah, exactly. And, and well, we could, and Citrix, VMware, Microsoft, we, we could deliver the shit out of an experience if we had five megabits also, you know? Yeah, right. It's, I mean, like, let's do remote effects all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, done. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Verizon so, and um, Comcast and all them would love you to do that too. Well, and so and so that's actually part of how they work. So 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 Jack managed to score contact with them. And we when, when I was in San Francisco a few weeks ago, we actually went down to Palo Alto and talked to him. Uh, we talked to their CEO Steve Perlman. Uh, before we even got into the meeting with this guy, uh, we were told all about his virtues. You know, he's he he was on the team that invented QuickTime or invented the technology that became QuickTime. He uh, is he 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 started the company that uh, he started Web TV and then sold it to Microsoft. Um, started the company that created the animation techniques that won an Academy Award for Benjamin Button and all sorts of stuff. So this guy's got a track record. But, He's Gabe, a- I'll add that we only learned about that, this track record about five minutes before before our meeting, so we didn't have time to process it. So we just sort of went in uh, thinking that he was, you know, some guy. Yeah, I mean, you know. Uh, it's and then afterwards it's like oh wait a second I'm like wow that dude fucking invented QuickTime man that's that's pretty cool <laughs> um but still like i don't know i mean we talked to a lot of people so it's it's for me it's i don't get starstruck that easily but that guy was cool and it would have been cool to like you know bullshit with him about that kind of thing but he probably has that happen all the time but either way so we went in there and we were armed with a lot of questions we're, we're, we want to know how it works what's the back end broker are you using virtualization what's the protocol um, but specifically, we wanted to learn how the hell is this licensed? I mean, they're giving away Windows desktops with Microsoft Office for free. And so we want to know how they're licensing it because it's a cloud-based solution de- delivering Windows 7 to random people. And we know from talking to these other uh, 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 DAS solutions out there like 2Cloud and, and, and Ding Desktone Cloud. And, and, yeah, yeah. Destone. Yeah, and these guys that we know from talking to them that that is a very hard thing to do from a Microsoft licensing standpoint. Technically speaking, it's solved, but licensing, Microsoft makes it hard because they don't have a, a service provider license for Windows 7. So this is so, as a service provider, you can provide terminal server desktops, you can provide Office, but if you're a service provider providing Windows 7 desktops, there's no service provider licensing, so the company you're providing desktops to, they have to own the licenses. 
Correct. Which is and why a desk tone or two cloud can do it because they're working to commercial customers, but if they're opening the whole world, like how does OnLive say, hey, here's your Windows desktop. Now don't use this unless you you bought your own, you know, little SA. <laughs> right. Well, and Desktone and, and Two Cloud and those guys, they um, they 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 have to keep each organization's desktops on dedicated hardware as well. So here's your here's your set of hosts that this is for this company, and here's another set of hosts dedicated to another company. And so they don't get to, you know, if you only use if you have five hosts and you use a hundred percent of four of them and five percent of the fifth one, you don't that other ninety five percent is wasted. They can't use that to service another another customer of theirs. Um, so th- so there's all sorts of intricacies. It's easy enough to work around, but Microsoft can make it easier. I was going to say, for those listening now to this, it's what Gabe was talking about, we'll revisit this in the Why Brian Hates Microsoft segment of the show later. Which is coming, yeah. I give it seven minutes. <clears throat> um, so, okay, so we go in there. We're armed with these questions. We were trying to be cool about it. We weren't trying to be like investigative beat reporters, that kind of a thing. But, you know, we, we're just bloggers, not real journalists here, just to be clear. <laughs> Gabe um, Knuth we, investigates. Yeah, we are whatever it took to get us into the meeting. Um, <laughs> so, um, but we sit down and I, and I explain where we come from and what 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 the things are that we think about. And uh, and he just launches into the demo that we've seen a bunch of times uh, overall, which was showing us how games work, showing us how we can shadow games, things like that. And 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 again, we we saw this demo. And when he goes into the Windows desktop world, he shows us how you know. Look, I can do this. It's on my iPad. Look, it's Windows. That kind of a thing. And huh. and and I, and I stopped and like, look, this is. We saw this demo in 1999. Like, this is. We we get this concept. We're fine there. But I want to know is how, you know, is there an instance of Windows running? Is it virtual? You know, how, how w- what we want to know, what people are asking me is, how is this licensed? And he kept deferring and deferring and deferring uh, to the point. He he actually said at one point that he that that he wasn't trying to be evasive. They just had it covered. They had a team of licensing guys. They're in compliance, and that's not the important thing. The really hard stuff is the uh, all, all how cool this experience is, or something to that effect. Um, and so you know, like you know, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, uh, <laughs> who may or may not be doing illegal things. <laughs> who was that? Uh, who who Art Matrano, the 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 magician that would do the crazy magic uh, YouTube for Art Matrano. Um, he was the guy that could make it look like he pulled his thumb apart, or uh, uh, he, he would put his hands together in a ring and then pull them apart like like they were those metal rings in real life. It was so it was just kind of like stage magic, really bad stage magic. Um, Either way, though, so so this is this went on for quite a while, and I feel like I was kind of a dick, even kind of. I just I wouldn't let up. I'm like, come on, you have to tell us. Like, how is this stuff licensed? Like, there has to be. I mean, you have to know this. This is this is something that a company to put out the solution, you would have to get this. And and if he knows, he didn't let on, and I think he just doesn't know. Um, I'm not saying nobody knows at on live. I'm just saying, you know, I I I believe that he does not know how it's licensed. Um, so that was kind of a disappointing thing to come out of there with, and and that was the crux of the article that I wrote, breaking down the solution. I explained how it works. I explained how you know they they get such good performance with the games because they do uh, this JPEG kind of compression when they can't keep up their UDP stream. They since the game is moving all the time, they can compress that visually. And it doesn't really have any effect on you as the gamer because the screen's moving around the entire time. Um, they also guarantee or, or they, they, they hedge their bets, really, with, with as far as the, the data connection goes to make sure that there's as few hops as possible by doing what they call peering with all the major ISPs in the country. So that way, my connection to their servers has as few hops as possible rather than just going through the public Internet. I mean, it's still the public Internet, but... Um, rather than just you know trying your luck and hoping you get a good connection every time, they they they've gone to great lengths to ensure that you get the best possible one. And that's why there's no on live Australia or on live in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, and right, and there is on live in Europe and things like that. And I, you know, as they roll that out, that's fine. But yeah, that's right. That's why you can't fire up a you know you can't take your video game thing client with you to India and and, and play. <clears throat> Excuse me. So. So we, we learned about some of the technical things of OnLive. We learned about how they're able to deliver the games and to deliver them well. But we also learned that they are very hung up on the fact that they, they feel that the games are the hardest thing in the world to remote. And so desktop should be no problem. And so if they can report, re- remote 720p, high def, they call it video games, which, as we learned, since if the connection suffers, then it just starts to compress that image. So if they can deliver these games 
uh, they think that they can deliver the desktops too. And the, the overall experience is fine if your connection is perfect, just like every other remote protocol out there. But once you start to introduce a little bit of latency or a little bit of packet loss, uh, then things start to go downhill pretty quick. And you see how... Uh, you remember Geek Week, how we, when we turned on the WAN emulator and it, all of a sudden it sort of exposed how these protocols worked? Oh, yeah, because it's kind of like running. It's like debugging in slow motion sort of. Yeah, exactly. And that's, and that's how this is too. Um, if I go stand exactly right next to my, my wireless access point down in the basement, it works just fine, right? But if I get to the other side of my house and I have a perfectly ample wireless connection to do absolutely everything else in the world, but it's, uh, it's, it's, still, it's not quite good enough for OnLive to use. And you can start to see, it almost looks like VMware, it looks like PC over IP is built to lossless, where it comes in really crappy and then kind of looks a little bit better and better and better. Um, and, and that's just, and that, that's the indication of how the protocol works when it comes to games, because it just doesn't have to be perfect. You don't have to have a sharp line around a little letter B on your screen. But for me, as a desktop user, my windows have to be crisp. My, you know, my, 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 my words have to look good. I have to be able to navigate in real time and not sit there and wait for and it. And I can't fall down to standard def, which is like whatever, 400, you know, 400 lines, which right. on a screen. So what's the monitor equivalent? Like, oh, we drop you down to 640 by 480. But don't worry, we stretch it and expand it back to fill up your 24-inch monitor. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what is that? Yeah, it's... um. It just, I just don't think that they translate. It makes sense, right? In my head, I believe that going down there, I believe that, hell yeah, man, if they can do games, that's badass. Yeah. They should be able to do desktops, no problem. Um, but it's about the protocol, and it's about how that works, how that translates to, to the desktop side. And like I said, I, I will fully give them, if you have a badass connection, if you've got 3 meg, 5 meg, no latency, that kind of a thing, you're doing, it, it's just fine. But again, um, so, is, so is vanilla RDP out of the box. That's also just fine on 3 megs with no latency. Absolutely, yep. Um, and then the other thing to note is that the you know they give you this they, they show the iPad client right now it's only available uh, as an iPad uh, offering uh, the the way there, there's no local keyboard there's no local options for anything so it uses exclusively uses the Windows Seven Touch interface which actually I don't know if anything else does that um, anything that we deal with day to day yeah those like HP computers that you have in your kitchen. Although oh, they come uh, well, with keyboards no, and mice I mean, too, like, though. But, but, but Citrix doesn't. You know, you couldn't. Zen Desktop doesn't have the touch, the Windows Seven Touch interface, right? Like you can't. Oh, I think remoting. Like you mean, like does it actually remote multi-touch versus just remoting the mouse yes. simulation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I, think, I think you're right. So they remote so, multi-touch. Uh, yes, they have. You're right. So yeah. and the, and so and the I demo mean, there I mean, was online cool. does online remotes multi-touch online. Yeah. 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 Um, and so that was, um, I mean, that was kind of neat. You could pinch zoom and things like that. But again, it just, the, the fact that you could do that was fine. But I missed having a local keyboard because, uh, you know, as much as, uh, picture how much you hate typing in a virtual desktop with the, with the native keyboard on your iPad. Now imagine doing that with the built-in Windows keyboard, waiting to send your, your oh, tap you're... to the key, yeah. having it come back to you. And in the meantime, your whole keyboard gets all screwed up because the connection dropped it's for blurry. You know, so yeah. you have to wait you have to wait for a round trip to work and like turn the button gray to even know you hit the right key yeah exactly and so you're everybody typing. in the video just got to watch me hit my mute button cough and then turn it back on you, so i coughed completely quietly it, that was uh that was advanced radio <laughs> um but so you have you know so you're, you're three paragraphs into the thing before you realize the, <laughs> that you missed a letter somewhere along the way no, you're not because you. I mean, you, you you're you're pain. It's you're painfully aware that you're missing letters. Oh. Constantly. <laughs> um, you're, you're three letters in before you're like, "Fuck this," and, <laughs> um, and then but it comes so, out as F space they, C K backslash <laughs> T blank blank S. <laughs> yeah. So and they tell you like they, before they even hooked us up with the demo, they they wanted to know if we had a Bluetooth keyboard, and I said yes because I I, I knew that that was going to happen, and obviously in Citrix and VMware and Oracle and whatever, I would much rather have a, a Bluetooth keyboard to connect to this thing and, 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 and to type into a iPad-based VDI or desktop session. Um, so I knew that that was coming, but I, I really I wanted to see what the remote multi-touch experience was like, and it wasn't any better than anything else. I mean, it was cool that you could do it, but that's all. So... so so that that was all the first article, right? So that was all like breaking down on live. That spurred a whole lot of discussion about how they're doing desktops and the licensing behind that and so on. And you could imagine, you know, guys like Geese were uh, from Two Cloud were were very uh, vocal 
in in the conversation around that. And um, well, yeah, all the real all the real cloud desktop providers are like, are these guys like they have a secret private agreement with Microsoft, or are they just ignorantly breaking the license agreement? Or well, right, and there's only so physical? many options, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, you could be you you. I went. I, I went so far as to, I. I never actually said that they're breaking this. You know, because I. It's all speculation, right? So I. I, I don't want to say that they're knowingly. But you can say I speculate that they're breaking license agreements. <laughs> well, that's exactly what I said. So I mean, so but that so that's one of the options, right? Yeah. So that one is they're they're blissfully unaware of it. Um, two is uh, that that they have something custom with Microsoft, or three. Uh, and, and this one was actually posited by, I think, Tal from Citrix and then uh, a few other people who helped back it up, was that they could be using Blade PCs. Um, they, and if they were using Blade PCs, uh, I learned that they're running Windows 7 Enterprise, by the way. Once I got in, I was able to poke around and see what was going on. So they could be using Blade PCs, uh, which is dedicated hardware, and then remoting that to people. And if, and, and if, if it's dedicated hardware, and then you can do whatever you want with it. And cause, because we're not using... It's at that point. It's more like log me in, right? Yeah, and the thing is, so the the because someone was mentioning, you know, they so on live also does with their games, their video game service. They offer access to Windows games. Mm -hmm. So and Windows games presumably require a properly licensed copy of Windows. So presumably they either had an agreement with Microsoft that worked with those Windows games, or they were like you were saying, maybe they're using Blade workstations with a central <laughs> image streaming to stream down the game or something like that. So presumably they already had some legal mechanism in place to deliver Windows games to people so they could maybe leverage that for their Windows desktops. My favorite is the big F you to Microsoft uh, theory that they had this custom games thing worked out that was supposed to be just for games. Um, like, okay, this is fine. It's just going to be, you know, you're going to be running Windows it's like the kernel, but, you know, the games are just going to be there and it's just going to be access to games. And then OnLive finds a loophole and says, hey, hey, we can do desktops too. Okay. And then starts putting the desktops out there, which I think is funny. I mean, who knows? I, I doubt that Microsoft would let that happen, but uh, you never know. Yeah. Wow. Um, so that so that that's where the loose ends article comes into play. Uh, somebody jumped in there and and found a VMware folder in C colon program files. Uh, I jumped in and looked at it too. Unless they're doing some trickery to hide the files from us, that folder is empty. Um, so my guess is that they just built the base image in VMware Workstation or something, and then saved it, and that folder just is you know still there, a remnant. Because there's no evidence of the agent, <clears throat> the, the VMware desktop agent, or anything like that. There. I can't find anything, yeah. right? So, and and that's not to say they're not there, but you know, uh, skin deep, it doesn't look like they're doing that. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, they could be, but. Um, and then, so I went on, like, you know, I mean, so are they using VMware? Are they using dedicated hardware, custom licensing? Those are all boring. So I thought, you know, I wonder, <laughs> <clears throat> so somebody actually pointed this out to me on Twitter, so I didn't just make it up out of thin air, but somebody wondered if they were an acquisition target. And so I got to thinking, I wonder who the hell would buy them. And then I remembered this article that you wrote, I don't know, 18 months ago, something like that, where you were, maybe it was two years ago, you were talking with Benny about the oh. whole point of remote effects. Yeah. And Benny suggested, he's like, dude, this isn't about, you know, remote protocols for, you know, local desk or for, for desktops in your organization. This is about serving Windows from the cloud. And then it went on to become, this is about Xbox from the cloud, too. I mean, think, think of where this could go, and this could go to Xbox from the cloud as well. And so, we're not, so then I think, all right, so we got games from the cloud, desktops from the cloud. All via this protocol that really works well when you got a bunch of <laughs> when you got a bunch of bandwidth by a guy who's built and sold companies to, to Microsoft, to Microsoft before. and Apple and these big these big enterprise IT yeah. companies. Yeah. So I feel like you know, I, I I feel like it's a little bit more qualified than a crazy ass <laughs> suggestion, but um, you know because it's not completely off off, off the wall. Uh, but but other than that, like I I mean. All I did was put these pieces together and kind of make this up. So, but I feel like, I mean, it could happen. It's one tick away from uh, crazy ass. crackpot theory. Yeah, but the yeah. thing is, but that's but 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 um, but protected though. <laughs> right, this is the saying, kind of thing you hang your hat on because in six months when this happens, guess who yeah, got it? You know, yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, oh. so we don't so, know any close. I mean, we're, we're we're no closer though to knowing what the hell they're doing. Like we we still to this day don't know. No, how the hardware is. We don't know how they're licensed. 